a video that we did on YouTube about it. I was so excited when it got released because I knew it was going to change people's lives. And people have actually written to me saying that this information that we're going to go over today has changed their life in terms of what they do and uh, how they feel. And they've actually noticed and felt better as a result of it. So today we're going to talk about light. Um, you know, the Lord is so good in terms of the information that he gives uh, even today, after we get done, it's going to seem like you learned a lot about light, but it's not even going to be the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that we don't know about light. And so we're going to try to, to work on that. And then I hope today, this, this presentation will probably last maybe about an hour or so, I hope today to do question and answer. So if you want to write down questions, um, we, we'll try to answer it. It doesn't have to be on light. It can be on anything that has to do with the health, health anything, okay? I'll try to answer to the best of my ability. Okay, so let's talk about light. So light is more than just a nice sunny day. Light actually impacts the human body in two major ways. We're going to talk about both of those major ways today. Um, one of those ways is through sleep and the circadian rhythm. We're going to talk about how sleep and the circadian rhythm is important for your health. That's the first way. The second way is through mitochondrial dysfunction. What is the mitochondria? The mitochondria is a small organelle that sits in, um, in every cell of your body except for your red blood cells. And its job is to produce energy for the cell. That's a really important job for it to do. Sunlight, we believe, actually impacts the mitochondria in your cells. Okay? You have mitochondria in your brain cells. You have mitochondria in your muscle cells. This is what allows you to do what you do. And the mitochondria, more importantly, is what metabolizes the food that you eat. So whether it's fats, whether it's proteins or carbohydrates, that's where this meets. And I'll, we'll bring actually some information that we talk about. So first, we're going to talk about sleep, the circadian rhythm, and mood in relation to light. The first thing that you have to understand, though, is the mitochondria, as we talked about. The mitochondria is like an engine in your car. The engine in your car, assuming that you don't have a Tesla or some other electric car, um, an ICE, as we call it, an internal combustion engine. The ICE, or the internal combustion engine, uses gasoline to create locomotion. And in the process of burning gasoline and creating locomotion, there is something that's generated called heat. And that heat can cause the engine to, to get bigger and seize up the engine if it's not dealt with. So the mitochondria is very similar in that, in that in the process of making energy, there are products that are made that can destroy the mitochondria if it's not dealt with. And so as a result of this, the mitochondria have two systems in place to make sure that it gets uh, taken care of. The, pro the product of energy production in the mitochondria is something called oxidative stress. You may have heard this before. You may have heard of antioxidants, oxidative stress, all of these sorts of things. Oxidative stress has actually been shown to lead to less optimal health. It's the primary reason, according to the Cleveland Clinic website and many other sources, of inflammation, of cancer, dementia, diabetes, and even learning disabilities. Okay, so if you talk about the young kids growing up, they have autism or they have difficulties understanding or learning. Um, think about, we're going to talk about how we get outside and, and what the impacts of this are going to be, and, and the results are going to be astounding. Like, you, you, how, how do we not know this? So oxidative stress is really important to deal with. So the body has two ways of dealing with it. There's a way to deal with it at night, and there's a way to deal with it during the day. Now, we actually know pretty well about how it's dealt with at night, because at night, there's a tiny gland in the brain called the pineal gland, and that pineal gland secretes melatonin. Melatonin is the most, one of the most powerful antioxidants known to man. It basically scavenges and mops up antioxidants very quickly. So if you can imagine, this pineal gland at night is secreting melatonin. Melatonin is secreted into the blood, and from the blood, it gets taken up into the cells and then goes into the mitochondria, and it's there in the mitochondria that it deals with these radicals. So let me explain a little bit more about that. As the mitochondria is making energy, I don't want to get too technical here, but basically what has to happen is that oxygen is turned into water. This is the reason why we breathe in air to get oxygen, because at the very final part of this thing called the electron transport chain, 
oxygen is converted into water. And the way that happens is, is that protons are put on the oxygen and oxygen, or O2, is turned into water. If that process doesn't happen completely, you get other hydroxy radicals like OH dots or superoxides dot. These are extremely reactive compounds. All they have to do is meander a few angstroms, and if they bump into a protein, they will denature the protein, and they will damage your mitochondria. So the body has to deal with them on the spot very quickly, and melatonin is one of the most powerful antioxidants. So the more melatonin you have, the safer your mitochondria is gonna be, and the, and the, the longer it's gonna work. So that's really important. In the daytime, what is proposed, and I'll show you the scientific studies, is that daylight or light from the sun, specifically near-infrared radiation, penetrates through your skin directly into the mitochondria and stimulates something called cytochrome C oxidase. There are proteins there that actually absorb wavelengths of light from the sun, and that stimulates production of melatonin there on the spot in the mitochondria. If you don't have enough of these antioxidants, the damage from oxidative stress can damage your mitochondria. And do you know what mitochondria does? We talked about it, it burns fats. And if you lose the ability to burn those fats, guess what happens to your fat? It goes up. And your inability to metabolize correctly will give you diabetes. Do you see where the, this, this is not a very far-fetched connection here, okay? So let's talk a little bit about the solar spectrum. Light from the sun, comes from, well, light from the sun is in many different frequencies. You may have learned this, actually, let me go back here. Um, light from the, the solar spectrum, 7% of the light from the sun is in the ultraviolet spectrum, and there's a specific component of ultraviolet light, which is UVB, which gives you vitamin D. So that, that light goes into your skin, and it converts the 25-hydroxy vitamin D into a, a com component that you can use, which is vitamin D. Then 39% of the energy from the sun is in the visible spectrum. That's what you can see with your eyes. But notice, a full 54% of the energy coming from the sun, you don't even see. It's in the infrared spectrum. And most of it is in the near-infrared spectrum, what we call NIR. That's between 760 nanometers and 1400 nanometers. So you can't even see that type of light coming from the sun, but it's there. And this is the type of light that penetrates deeply into your skin. So how many of you will pull up to a stop sign? I don't know, this maybe, maybe this doesn't happen much in, in downtown Walla Walla, but I can tell you in Los Angeles, you can pull up to a stoplight and somebody else will pull up to a stoplight next to you playing that thing they call music. And uh, what you'll hear is just the vibrations coming through that car, boom, boom, boom. right? Isn't that what you hear? Don't you hear the low frequency sounds? That's because low frequency sounds have, a, have the ability to penetrate through metal much better than high frequency sounds. Well, the same thing happens with light. So low frequency light, that, that type of light in the infrared has a much better propensity to penetrate deeply in. It can penetrate through your clothes. How many remember about 20 years ago when Sony uh, came up with a great idea? They said, hey, I know, we'll have a camcorder that uh, has a near infrared light on it that will be able to make you see better at night and have night vision, remember that? And what they didn't realize is that, oops, this light can actually penetrate clothes, and they quickly removed that camera from the market. That's because near-infrared light can penetrate through your clothes, and it can actually penetrate through your skin down deep into your tissue, okay? Not so much with ultraviolet. So if you're concerned about ultraviolet light, if you're concerned about getting damaging effects from ultraviolet radiation, put on sunscreen, put on a layer of clothing, you're still gonna get the benefits of near-infrared light. You're not gonna have to worry about that. And you guys, you guys know this intuitively. If you go out on a bright summer day and you've got a t-shirt on and you close your eyes, can you feel which direction the sun is hitting you? Absolutely, that's because the sun's near-infrared is penetrating through your clothes and it's giving you that near-infrared radiation. Okay, so let's back up again because we said we were gonna talk first about light and circadian rhythm. So let's talk about the circadian rhythm. In your brain is a nucleus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. I'm gonna say these funny terms and you're going to, I don't want you to like tune out because I'll be using these things over and over. The suprachiasmatic nucleus is like the conductor of an orchestra. Um, in, throughout the or in throughout your body are many different processes that have to be coordinated. And just like the conductor of an orchestra, 
will conduct an orchestra to make sure that everybody starts the piece of music at the same time so that you get the right piece of music. The suprachiasmatic nucleus of your brain is coordinating all of the clocks in all of the cells of your body so that they're all doing the right thing at the same time. This is really important. Um, why do I say this is important? Craig, Craig is here. You know, I use this example all the time when I talk about this. I say, I have a friend who used to work at Disneyland at night. Craig, I'm not going to ask you to speak, but this Craig is the one who, and he used to tell me about these things that where he would work at Disneyland at night. And, it was, and this is a great example. So what would happen at night is that at night uh, at Disneyland, obviously the park shuts down. The people are not coming into the park. Guess who comes into the park? The gardeners come into the park, the engineers come into the park, the people who fix the rides come into the park, the people who restock the stores come into the park. You don't want them there during the day. During the day, you have to have the facade of the, right? It's a character, right? You don't want Mickey Mouse taking his hat off and then walking out to the front gate, right? Because it completely takes away from the facade of Disneyland, right? So your body is far more complex than Disneyland. There are parts of the time of day that your body needs to be under rest and repair, and there are times of the day when your body has to be feeding and building. If your body is feeding and building the whole time, you're not going to get the chance to break things down and to rebuild better. Okay, that's really important. That, we can get into a whole talk about intermittent fasting and how that works. But all of these repair processes have to be on a time schedule. So your circadian rhythm is extremely important. Now, here is a diagram showing how this works. So you've got the brain in the middle, and you'll notice there you've got the eyeball, and you see that blue light sort of going into the eye, um, and you can see there that uh, light it can come in during the day or in the night, okay? Now, there is something called an intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell. We'll call it an IPRGC. Uh, this is a receptor in your eye that detects light but it does not go to your brain at the occipital lobe where you actually see. This is, this is basically, if you want to try to imagine this, this is a subconscious realization that there is light. Okay? These retinal ganglion cells go directly to the SCN, which is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and they tell the suprachiasmatic nucleus what time of day it is. If there is light, it tells your brain that it's daytime. If there is no light, it tells your brain that it's nighttime. And your brain, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the conductor, is getting the cue from the producer of the show that it's time to start the show. Does that make sense? So, it's, so light is one of the major affectors of your circadian rhythm. Now, what does the circadian rhythm do if it gets light? If it gets light, it says, oh, it's daytime. Therefore, it's not time to sleep. And notice what it does. There's a red little bar there that goes to something called the pineal gland, which we talked about. And it says, don't make melatonin. This is really important for you to understand. What this means is light into your eyes means no melatonin. Everyone understand that at this point? Okay. Not only that, okay, so the, the pineal gland, the supercosmetic nucleus, is kind of like fool me once, shame on you. Fail, fool me twice, shame on me. So not only, so, so the pineal gland's like, hmm, I thought it was time to secrete melatonin because it's nighttime. But clearly, we're seeing light here. So it cannot be nighttime. I must be off. I must be mistimed. It must be earlier than I thought it was. Therefore, I'm going to delay my circadian rhythm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so in other words, it could be 10 o'clock at night, and it's dark outside. But you are up, and you have light in your eyes, or you're on your smartphone. So what does the pineal gland say, suprachiasmatic nucleus say? It's not night, it's daytime, and we messed up. Therefore, we need to delay our circadian rhythm. Okay? And I'll make a note here. Those IPRGCs, those intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, they are typically located in the inferior retina. And because your eye and your lens flip the image, the light that's going to be most sensitive, the light that's going to be most affective in this case, is light up here. Because the light up here is going to get flipped around and it's going to hit the retina down here, which is then going to go to suprachiasmatic nucleus. And the peak sensitivity is 460 and 484 nanometers. That's blue light. But, but don't get mistaken, it can be any kind of light. But the ones that do it the best 
the ones that affect the suprachiasmatic nucleus the best are those in the blue light area. Now, this, you may think this is a bad thing at night, and you're right, but it's a good thing in the morning, in the day, right? So getting outside and getting your eyes exposed to light in the morning is what you want to do because it's telling your suprachiasmatic nucleus, hey, it is daytime, and we're waking up, and here we go. And, and if you get up extra early, you can fool your circadian rhythm the other direction because you say, oh, it's daytime, and oh, I was a little bit late. Obviously, it's here already. I must advance my circadian rhythm. So can you see how the use of light can actually change your circadian rhythm based on where you are? This is the reason why when you get on a plane and fly to the East Coast, you're not continuously on Washington time. Because when you go to the East Coast, your circadian rhythm after a while is going to catch up. You understand what I'm saying? Light is very important. Okay, so what is regulated by this circadian rhythm? Just about everything. Okay, so circulating melatonin reduces cancer, cortisol production, antioxidant sleep, regulation, peripheral clocks, feeding and fasting rhythms, and it goes on and on. Body temperature, pancreas, glucose metabolism, vasopressin, cortisol, all of these things are extremely important in terms of all of the diseases that we see here in the Western world. Very, very important. What happens when you have dysregulation of your circadian rhythms? Well, we have studies in rodents that show you get reduced body temperature, you get increased adiposity, that means you're gaining weight. Altered immune response, tumor development. What happens in humans when we get dysregulation of your circadian rhythm? Induced sleep-wake misalignment, unscheduled secretion of insulin, leptin, and norepinephrine, and uh, increased markers of insulin resistance and inflammation. What does that mean? Diabetes, hypertension cancer, all of these things. And those are all the studies to show it. Okay, so let me give you uh, what happens. So imagine you're on a desert island and there is no other sources of electricity. Your circadian rhythm is gonna be perfectly aligned with the environment around you because when the sun comes up, you're gonna get light coming into your eyes and when the sun goes down, there's gonna be no more light. You're on a desert island. And, and just by the way, even though your eyelids are closed, what do we say about light? It can go through. So if you are sleeping with your eyes closed and you're outside and the sun comes up, you're still going to get stimulation of the eyes. In fact, we'll talk about this a little bit later. There are actual light bulbs that you can buy called dawn simulation bulbs that you put in your bedroom and you have them timed to come on to simulate the sun coming up in your bedroom and it works even though your eyes are closed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So what happens here in this situation? Here in this situation, your circadian rhythm, which is on top, is perfectly aligned with reality, which is on the bottom. I've got their night ending at 6 o'clock in the morning and night starting at 6 o'clock p.m. Can you all see that? Perfectly aligned. You're on a desert island. Now what happens? <laughs> Do these things look familiar? Computers, monitors, lights, smartphones all of these sorts of things, right, that you're putting up in your face, right, okay? What's that gonna do to our circadian rhythm? Fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? So number one, it's not gonna secrete melatonin, but notice what happens, it's gonna say, so what you're telling your, your body is, hey, it's not really night, it's day. And your circadian rhythm's like, oops, I'm sorry, let me adjust myself, and that's what it does. It shifts, it delays. So what happens? When you try to go to bed at night, your circadian rhythm is like, uh-uh, it's not time yet. And so you wanna go to bed at nine or 10 o'clock, but your circadian rhythm is like, no, we don't go to bed until 11 or 12. But it still wants seven hours of sleep at least. And so what happens the next day? So whereas you had insomnia at night, you have hypersomnia in the morning. And what happens when you have hypersomnia in the morning? You buy stocks in Starbucks. <laughs> I tell you, I went to the airport and I was waiting at a terminal at six o'clock in the morning and I'm not kidding you. The only place open was Starbucks and it was a line 30 deep. And people could not operate effectively until they had caffeine because of this. This is what's going on. Do you see how it's misaligned? It's, it's not aligned correctly, and so light happens. So if you put light at that part of the day, you're gonna get a delayed circadian rhythm. So 
Light after sunset tends to delay your circadian rhythm by suppressing melatonin production in the pineal gland, and this causes your body to delay sleep onset. However, light early when you wake up tends to advance your circadian rhythm, but it requires more intensity given that IPRCGs are less sensitive at that time of the day, and this causes your body to advance sleep onset. So my advice for you would be to get up in the morning, don't turn on the light, don't go to the room that has the window that has the sun coming in. Listen to me very carefully. Go outside. How many here are photographers, have worked with, with uh, cameras? Okay, so you'll know what I'm talking about. If you like to manually set your cameras and you're setting up for a photograph inside a room in the house, you have it all set up beautifully. What, were you, what would happen if you took that camera and you took it outside with those very same settings and you tried to take a picture? What would it look like? It'd be a whiteout, whitewash. And that's because the amount of lux in a room, in a room in the house is about 50 lux. Outside, on a bright sunny day, 100,000 lux. That's the difference. Why do we not sense that difference? It's because our pupils constrict down. We automatically adjust our, so we can't tell that there's that much more light outside than there is inside. So if you want to get light to your eyes to stimulate your body to make sure that you have a good circadian rhythm, get outside in the morning. Can't say it enough. Even a cloudy day is way brighter than being inside your home in the morning, okay? All right, let's talk about another aspect of this. There is the IPRGCs not only go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the major conductor of your body, but it also goes to a place called the perihabenular nucleus. You're like, this is really too deep here, Dr. Schwell. I don't need to know all these things. This is important to understand because this part of the brain actually influences mood, which for us living in Southern California may be not as big, but I'm, ass I'm assuming here that those that are living in Canada and maybe here in Washington, this is a little bit more of an issue because of your latitude. We'll talk more about latitude. When people don't get enough stimulation of this part of the brain, you become depressed. And there's a condition, you guys know, right? Seasonal affective disorder. It affects quite a number of people. Um, here's a, uh, here is a, um, a, a screenshot looking at light use emitting e-readers negatively affects sleep, circadian timing, and next morning alertness. So, what they did here was they had people read books using a soft, dim light versus people looking at an e-reader. And you can see there that the amount of lux coming from the e-reader book, can you see it there? Now, if you look really carefully down by the uh, flat axis there, you'll see little bumps. That's from the print book. So the amount of light coming from an e-reader is much, much more than it is reading, from, reading a book from soft light reflecting off of it. And what did they find when they did this? Those that read the e-reader took significantly longer to go to bed at night. And it's no surprise, they have less melatonin. Okay, so this, even that difference can affect, there's a very small difference of light. Think about your kids that you put into the bedrooms at night and you leave the light on, or you leave the night reader on. I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think that leaving lights on in bedrooms is a good idea because that light can penetrate through your eyes and actually shut down the production of melatonin in these people. And melatonin is an extremely powerful antioxidant, and it prevents, uh, in, in a lot of cases, at least in animals, cancer, there's some evidence. So what should you do in the morning? Number one, sunlight before nine o'clock for 30 seconds to a full 30 minutes. It depends on how much sun or clouds there are. No sunglasses. You don't need to look at the sun, but no sunglasses, no blue blockers. You want as much blue light as possible. No windows. No windshields, if you have glasses or contacts, that's fine. It will take anywhere between seven to 50 times longer if, you have, um, if you're behind glass, okay? If you can't get that, you say, wait a minute, Dr. Schwell, uh, excuse me, you're not lecturing in California, you're lecturing up here in Washington, uh, where sometimes there is no sun at that hour of the day. So, this is where you can invest maybe 20 to $25 uh, in a, something called a SAD lamp, S-A-D lamp. Okay, if so, if, if uh, depression is an issue, get a 10,000 lux lamp, set it up about 11 to 15 inches from your eye in the morning, and turn it on for about 20 minutes. That will give you enough light. You need about 3,000 lux hours. 
So if it's 10,000 lux and you do it for a third of an hour, that's going to be about 3,000 lux hours. Imagine if you were to go outside and it was 100,000 lux outside, full bright sun. How long would you have to stay outside to just get 3,000 lux hours? Not very long at all, maybe five minutes? That's all you have to do if it's bright sun. Getting outside and make sure you're getting that anchoring light into your eyes to tell your circadian rhythm what time it is. What should you do in the evening? Limit light as much as possible after sunset. I would say after nine o'clock, turn down lights as low as you possibly can. If you have to have lights on in the house, have them low in your visual fields because they will then get reflected onto your superior retinal space, which has very little retinal IPG, IPCGs. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's the overhead lighting that's the worst. You may notice on your computer screens that after nine o'clock, it changes its hue to a more red color. That's a gimmick. Any kind of light is gonna be inhibiting your melatonin. Okay, and it's gonna be delaying your circadian rhythm. So dim, low, and red. Think about this, I, I love this, I love this. What did we used to do 100 years ago? Light a candle, what, if you're outside, if you're going up to my, Camp Myvedin or outside camping, what do you do? A fire, and is the fire high up or low down? And is it a lot of blue light or a lot of red light? We were, we were made for this. We were made for this. This is not, don't you, don't, don't you guys notice that when you go camping, you have a nice fire, and after that you talk, tell stories, you, you commune around the fire, do you sleep well that night? You sleep well that night. You sleep well. Don't stay up and watch CNN or NBC or Fox or I'll, I'm going to use all of the networks so I don't, you know. It's all bad news. It's just bad news on different sides, but it's all bad news, okay? And you get anxiety, your eye, your eye it's, it's, not, it's all bad stuff. Okay, what are other ways to mitigate light exposure? Mac, iPhone, PC, tablets, Android. There's this thing called uh, install f.lux, which is free, you can do that. Um, blue blockers at night may not be a bad idea. Let's say, you know, well, look, we're professionals and we have to be up at night, perhaps, with something has to get done. Maybe wearing blue blockers at night might be beneficial. Low lighting as much as possible. Use dim lighting, wear for about three to four hours before bedtime. Use warm red light, dim below your eyes rather than overhead light. Minimize light pollution, especially in the bedroom, especially up high. Okay, so limit light after nine o'clock. We've just discovered this stuff in the last 20 years, 20, 30 years. This is new information. We did not know this before. The area of sleep medicine is exploding, and the amount of information that we're understanding is as, as well. Okay, so we talked about sleep, circadian rhythm, mood. What I didn't, I, I kind of skipped over some things because of time, but there are studies that show that when you expose your eyes to bright light in early morning, using they've done studies with dawn simulation, where the light gets brighter and brighter and brighter as you get up, they've known that you have better cognitive testing during that day, that there's less sleep inertia. What is sleep inertia? You can jump out of bed and you feel well rested when that light is coming up in the morning, okay? So it's almost like a cup of coffee <laughs> without the coffee. Light in the morning, good. Light in the evening, bad. So it's the same thing, it's just at a different time, and it can have a tremendous difference. Why? Because of your circadian rhythm. It would be bad to have the gardeners coming in to Disneyland while you're in line for Space Mountain, right? It's okay if they come in at night, right? It would be bad to have the engineers working on Thunder Mountain when you have a line of people that want to get on there. Do you understand what I'm saying? But that's what's happening when you're doing things out of sync with your circadian rhythm. When you're eating late at night, body wasn't designed to eat at night, okay? You may not know that. The best time to eat is in the morning. That's when your, your insulin has the best sensitivity. That's why someone told us once to eat breakfast like a king, eat lunch like a a prince, I heard, but queen, that's fine. And then eat, uh, uh, eat dinner like a pauper. You've all heard that. And you know what? Science is actually confirming that to be the case. All right, let's talk about the mitochondria. This is really amazing stuff. Okay, that's the mitochondria in your cell. It's these small, little organelles that have a very high surface area that metabolize sugars, proteins, and fats into reducing agents, and then the reducing agents cause these protons and electrons to go over the electron transport chain, 
and then you get the protons coming back into the matrix, which then makes ATP, okay? Again, oxidative stress, less optimal health, inflammation, you have night and day. We talked about the pineal gland. Melatonin is very important at night when you're less active in terms of reducing the oxidative stress in the mitochondria. Very important to do. During the day, we also need that because we're actually much more active. We need more energy. We're revving our engine up, and we need a good cooling system. And one of the ways that science is showing is that near-infrared radiation from the sun actually stimulates on-site production of melatonin in the mitochondria. So this is a study, and I've actually talked to Russell Ryder and Scott Zimmerman, and they, they published this back in uh, February of 2019 called Melatonin and the Optics of the Human Body. This is going to blow your mind, what I'm about to show you. They show that, potent, that melatonin has potent antioxidant activity. Melatonin is produced within the mitochondria in response to sunlight and provides targeted protection of mitochondria from reactive oxygen species. This is the cooling system. Accordingly, melatonin is protective against a range of diseases characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction, including cancers, neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. And it may have a role in the prevention and or treatment of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and even COVID-19, okay? We'll show you that. This is a quote from the paper. It has now been shown that the mitochondria produce melatonin in many cells in quantities which are orders of magnitude higher than that produced in the pineal gland. This subcellular melatonin does not necessarily fluctuate with our circadian clock or release into circulation system, but instead has been proposed to be consumed locally in response to the free radical density within each cell, in particular in response to near-infrared exposure. So we discovered, and we've known for years, that the pineal gland in the brain makes melatonin, but that's, only, that's less than 5% of the total body melatonin that's actually produced in the human body. Mo the majority of it is produced on-site in the mitochondria in response to near-infrared radiation. They say, based on optical and biological review of the literature, it is proposed that the NIR portion of natural sunlight stimulates an excess of antioxidants in each of our healthy cells, and that the cumulative effect of this antioxidant reservoir is to enhance the body's ability to rapidly and locally deal with changing conditions throughout the day. In this approach, the role of circulatory melatonin produced by the pineal gland is to provide an efficient method of delivering supplemental melatonin during periods of low cellular activity and solar stimulus to damage or aging cells, both diurnal and nocturnal animals. While circulatory melatonin may be the hormone of darkness, pineal gland, subcellular melatonin in the mitochondria may be the hormone of daylight. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Okay. So again, what part of the solar spectrum are we talking about? We're talking about this near-infrared radiation that's outside of the visible spectrum. You cannot see it. It's near-infrared from 760 to 1400 nanometers, penetrates into the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous tissue, depending on the wavelength, and you perceive it in real life as heat from the sun. Here is a solar radiation spectrum once again. You can see that, that those two dark lines in the middle there is the visible. Everything to the right of that is, is uh, near-infrared radiation. And you can see that the majority of the energy from the sun is in the near-infrared and infrared spectrum. You can see here clearly again that when we're talking about the skin, that the more you go into the reds and infrared, the deeper it's going to penetrate even down to the subcutaneous layers and even into the muscle. So this has a very good ability to penetrate through things. Whereas as you can see on the ultraviolet side, it doesn't have that ability very well. That's why clothes can stop ultraviolet light. That's why sunscreen can stop ultraviolet light, but not so infrared light. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Here is a scattergram of what happens with near infrared radiation in both melanin rich on the left and melatonin deficient, that would be more whiter skin, on the right. In both cases, near-infrared radiation penetrates, it says in this graph, up to eight centimeters. Think about if you were to look at the human body and go in eight centimeters in all directions. There would be a core, a small core in the middle of your body that would probably be um, not able to be reached by near-infrared radiation, but the majority of your body could be reached by near-infrared radiation, unless, of course, you were what? 
obese. Interesting, isn't it? So here's a good application of what we're talking about. How many here have tried to put in um, lines into people, right? As a nurse, right, there's these new techniques that you can use where you can shine a light and you'll be able to see the veins very clearly. That uses near-infrared technology where the light gets shone onto the skin, it penetrates through the skin, and the blood and the blood vessel absorbs that light and then it comes back out and it's able to, uh, to show you exactly where the blood vessels are. So here's an example. On the left, we have visible light, and on the right, we can see right through the skin and we can see the, the blood vessels in the, in the hand so we can put an uh, IV in if we had to. Do you see this? Okay. Here's a graph showing the number of cells in the human body. The black is the number of cells as you go from being a child to an adult and then elderly. And you can see here what we already knew and that's being 25 years old is the best that you're ever gonna be in your entire life. Trust me, I'm almost 50, this works. But the red is all of the cells that are penetrable or accessible to near infrared light. And you can see that that's the majority of the cells in your body. So the majority of the cells in your human body can sense light external to your body. You didn't know that, did you? You thought the skin stopped all of it and it was a big dark mess inside. Have you ever gone at night and just put a flashlight up to your hand? Can you see through it? Of course you can. This doesn't make any sense, this thinking. Light penetrates through your skin and can go into many of the cells of your human body. Even That's just visible light. Not even near infrared light. So we are beings that are created to be accessible to light. And that light comes from the sun. And it's free. This is going to blow your mind, literally. So the scientists have looked at this and the physicists have actually said, have actually shown that when you shine light onto someone's head, that the, that the light is able to penetrate through the skull and this should not be, for those of you in the medical field, this should not be a surprise to you. How in physical examination class, when we try to see whether or not someone's sinuses are blocked, we will actually shine a light on the sinus and look in their mouth to see if light comes through. It's called transillumination. And it's a technique to see whether or not light is going into the cavity. Okay, so light, can, in that situation, light is penetrating the skin, the skull, going into the cavity, coming out through the, the, the bone and through the mucosa, and you can see the light. But what they're saying here is that light penetrates the skull and then the cerebral spinal fluid around the brain diffuses that light all around the skull, all around the brain, and then the sulci and the gyri, the crevices, focus that light down deep into the crevices so that the gray matter that coats the sulci and gyri of the brain, which are very rich, high energy, lots of mitochondria can be bathed in the near infrared from the sun. And they actually show you a model where that actually is happening. Think about that. In fact, the design, the design that is used on the surface of the brain is exactly the same design that engineers use when they put the coating on, on a military aircraft to prevent radar from detecting them because it, it takes the sound waves and it diffuses it within the structure of the, of the, of the, uh, of the airplane. Yeah. This is, the, it's, the brain is specific, these are engineer, light engineers. The coding of the brain outside is specifically designed, it seems, to them, as engineers, to harvest light, the cerebral spinal fluid diffuses it, and then it gets absorbed to the mitochondria exactly where it needs to be. Do you notice that the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside? The white matter is our, um, our axons that transmit the, neuron, the, the neuronal uh, transmission of electricity, but the cell bodies where the mitochondria are on the outside. This is what they're, this is what they're discovering. It's fascinating. Um, here's, here's an actual, this is what I'm talking about. So here's a light that's put on someone's uh, eyebrow here, and you can see the frontal sinus lighting up in that upper left-hand corner. Here is a light that's being placed on the maxillary sinus, and can you see when you look inside the mouth, you can see that the maxillary sinus is lighting up. That's because bone can transmit light. I want you to know this because when I start telling you about when people, when we show studies about when people go outside, that their 
neurological diseases improve, that their gray matter size improves, that when I start to tell you that multiple sclerosis is associated with latitude, we all knew this for years, but we didn't know why. It's because we were designed to be outside. Do you, does anyone know how, what is the average American, how, how long does the average American spend inside in their, in their day? It's 93%. Only seven, and that has dramatically changed in the last hundred years. Dramatically changed. Dramatically, all right? So it gets even better because this near-infrared radiation that comes from the sun is very plentiful, but there's something that just takes it to the next level, and that is fresh, green grass and leaves. So we all know that leaves produce, uh, uh, perform photosynthesis. And we know that photosynthesis requires red and blue light to excite those electrons to make the sugar. But the leaves themselves are designed in a way that they reflect specifically, reflect, not absorb, but reflect near infrared radiation. And so if you are outside on a nice summer day and there is green trees and green plants, not only are you getting near infrared directly from the sun, you're also, it's hitting the leaves and the trees and coming to you that way as well. You're getting a super bolus of near infrared radiation. You all know this int intuitively. On a hot summer day, what happens when you go under a tree? Is it warmer or cooler? It's much cooler, and why? It's because the leaves are reflecting all of that near infrared radiation away. So what's left under the tree? It's cool. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so, so we know from scientific studies that people who live in green spaces, people who live in green environments, people who are outside, much lower risk of diabetes, much lower risk of dementia, much better findings of health. I, I, think, I think it's amazing, it's interesting. But that's something that'll do it. So here is a near-infrared picture of a, a landscape. Look at the grass. Look at the trees. It's like they're like covered with snow. It's because they're so bright and white. It's because near-infrared radiation is reflecting off of these leaves and grass. This is what it looks like in a green environment. Here's another one of Central Park. Notice the difference between the buildings and the trees. The buildings are dark. They're not reflecting any near-infrared radiation. And as a result of that, uh, if you grow up in a concrete jungle, the only near-infrared radiation is if you're actually standing directly in the sun. None of it gets reflected. If you're, if you're sitting out under a shade tree, but you're still able to see this in front of you, you're getting plenty of near-infrared radiation, even if you're covered. You understand? If you're wearing a long sleeve shirt and pants, you're getting, all of that is penetrating through. You're getting near-infrared radiation. So what's the key to get near-infrared radiation? Be outside. Are you guys getting, so when I started feeling this, when I started reading this, I had this urge to like, okay, I need to take a break, I'm going to go outside. You guys have this urge to go outside right now? I had the same urge. You're like, what are we doing in here? All right, so here, here's, here's, a, here's a, a, a paper that was published in Environmental Research. The Health Benefits of the Great Outdoors, a Systemic Review and Meta-Analysis of Green Space Exposure and Health Outcomes. Here's a quote from the paper. We found that spending time in or living close to natural green space is associated with diverse and significant health benefits. It reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, premature death, preterm birth, increases sleep duration, people living closer to nature, also had reduced diastolic blood pressure, heart rate, and stress. In fact, one of the really interesting things we found is that exposure to green space significantly reduces people's levels of salivary cortisol, a physiological marker of stress. There's even more benefits that I'm not even telling you about. I could tell you about, this is how I tell you about it without telling you about it. I could tell you about the Japanese CEOs that they took up to the Hanoki Cypress Forest and had them forest bathe. What they found was that there are phytocytes that come off of these trees that they breathe in that stimulate the immune system that lasts for guess how long? A week. So you just do it once a week and you get the benefit once a week. Okay, and then when they took them down to the hotel in Tokyo and infused the phytocytes into the hotel room, they noticed all of the same health benefits except for one health benefit. 
they had higher urinary cortisol levels because there's something about getting out into nature that reduces cortisol levels, which is better for your stress. You want high cortisol levels in the morning, you don't want high cortisol levels uh, in the evening. Going outside and exposing your eyes to bright light in the morning will cause you to have a nice bump in your cortisol in the morning and therefore it will stay low for the rest of the day. And this is more, more of that technique. Um, okay. Here's a, here's a nice little break. Uh, LNG White, 1827 to 1915, provided financial support for um, John Harvey Kellogg to go to medical school. And she's also known as Smithsonian's 100 most significant Americans of all time. She was a health reformer. Uh, let's see what she said. She said, trees with medicinal properties. The Lord has been giving me light in regard to many things. He has shown me that our sanitarium should be erected on as high an elevation as necessary to secure the best results and that they are to be surrounded by extensive tracts of land, beautified by flowers and ornamental trees. Isn't that interesting? She didn't know why but it was probably because it reflects a lot of near-infrared light and gives off these phytocytes. In a certain place, preparations were being made to clear the land for the erection of a sanitarium. Light was given me that there is health in the fragrance of the pine, that the cedar and the fir, and there are several other kinds of trees that have medicinal properties that are health-promoting. Let not such trees be ruthlessly cut down. Let them live. Here's, here's, a, uh, here's a table from a senior thesis paper. And the senior thesis paper referred to this as daylighting. And she basically summarized all of the benefits in the scientific literature that is well known about people being outside in light. So vitamin D improved, student's vision improved, calcium absorption, bone formation, biological clocks, mood, cheerful, student attendance, sleep, Learning achievement improved, student attendance improved, test scores improved. What was reduced? Headaches, cancers, stomach ulcers, high blood pressure, stress, microbes, depression, fatigue, seasonal affective disorder, violent behavior, stress, security, all of these issues. Folks, they've known this for decades. In fact, if you want to build a school, there are certain federal guidelines that are required for the size of the windows in any kind of educational building because we know without a, without a shadow of a doubt that the more natural light that comes into a student's environment when they're learning, the better they learn. We know that, that's, that's fact. And because of that, we have certain guidelines that educational buildings are treated differently than residential buildings. But should it matter? I don't think so. Uh, Shining the Light on Sunshine, a systematic review of the influence of sun exposure on type 2 diabetes mellitus-related outcomes. Guess what they found? Uh, it's hard to see those arrows, but basically the direction of association was down when you had more light exposure. More light exposure, more sunshine, reduced type 2 diabetes. This is a great study. I love this study. Associations of outdoor temperature between sunlight and cardiometabolic traits in two European population-based cohorts. They looked at Oxford and they looked at Leiden in the Netherlands, and they did a very simple test. They said, come and get your blood drawn, we're going to look at your metabolic rates, we're gonna look at your diabetes, we're gonna look at your triglycerides, we're gonna look at all of that. And they did it, and they got the blood, and then what they did was they went back and looked in those cities what the weather report was for the previous seven days of, in those weather reports. And they said, how many days of sunlight did we have in the previous seven days before they got their blood drawn? Folks, do you know something? It's hard to look at this data, but basically, the more sun, the more days of sun they had in the previous seven days, the better their metabolic rates, the better their diabetes, the better their cholesterol, all of those things. Just seven days. That's all it took to have an improvement in all of those factors. Okay, so let's look at light a little bit more carefully. Here is a graph looking at the visible spectrum and ultraviolet in terms of ionizing radiation, okay? So there's probably a dermatologist listening to me. It's like, everything he's telling you is heretical. You should avoid the sun at all costs. You should stay inside. You're going to get skinned. Here's the issue. I, they are correct that the sun can cause sun damage. There's no question about it. But the type of light that comes from the sun that causes skin damage, as you can see, is in the ultraviolet spectrum. Ultraviolet, fortunately, is the type of light that doesn't penetrate very well. And so when the sun is coming up in the morning, 
that sun has to, has to skite right through a whole bunch of atmosphere to get to you. There's very minimal ultraviolet radiation in that light. As the sun starts to get higher and higher in the sky, once it reaches about 10 o'clock, depending on what month it is, now it can directly penetrate through that atmosphere. It's a much uh, shallow atmosphere. And now you're starting to get more ultraviolet radiation. By the time that sun hits about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and starts going down, again, there's hardly any ultraviolet radiation. So if you want to avoid the damaging effects of the sun, be concerned about ultraviolet radiation. Okay? How do you prevent ultraviolet radiation from damaging you? You wear a layer of clothing. That's all you have to do. If you don't want to wear a layer of clothing, you can put sunscreen on. You can do all of those things. That will prevent ultraviolet radiation, but it will not prevent infrared radiation. It will penetrate through that. There is a little bit of interesting findings, though, when you look at sun exposure and melanoma, for instance. Let's look at some skin cancers. So what did they notice here? Here was sun exposure and mortality from melanoma. What did, the thing, what did they find in a cohort that they published that was associated with an increased risk of death in melanoma? It was melanoma thickness. It was mitosis. It was ulceration, head and neck placement, depending on where it was. No surprise. But what was associated with a decreased risk of death? Sunburn, high intermittent sun exposure, solar elastosis. That's basically a term that has to do with, with, uh, with actual skin damage or sun damage from the skin. Those things were associated with a lower risk of melanoma. Okay? Here's another one. Avoidance of sun exposure is a risk factor for all-cause mortality results from the melanoma in southern Sweden cohort. This is a very famous study. And what did they show? that if you had sun avoiding behavior, you had lower mean survivals than if you had active sun exposure. And we're talking about very white people up in Scandinavia. Okay? They are at risk for having a paucity of sun exposure up there. Let's face it. All right? What about interdependence of contributions of sun exposure and vitamin D to MRI measures in multiple sclerosis? So check this out. In the multiple sclerosis patients, which are on the two top graphs, what we do there is we've sorted them out from the, the quarter of people who had the least sun exposure all the way to the quarter of people that had the most sun exposure. And what did we see? <clears throat> that gray matter volume improved in the brain. That means the gray matter in the brain was bigger in those people that had more sun exposure. And you're like, how could that possibly be? But now that I've told you that the sun could actually penetrate through the skull, get diffused through the cerebral spinal fluid, and actually get into the mitochondria of the brain, now you've got nice coolant systems. Those mitochondria are gonna be very well taken care of, and they're gonna be able to make plenty of energy, which is the key to avoiding dementia. Same thing in the controls, as you can see. All right, what about COVID-19? Buckle up. You guys may not know this, but let's look at influenza. Every sing Do you know that this is what happens every single year when influenza, we know when influenza comes. It's not like, hey, you know, from an individual standpoint, we don't know if you're going to, we, we know from a public health standpoint, every single year, there's going to be thousands and thousands of people that are dying from influenza. Why do you think that is? Exactly. There's no sun. Because this looks exactly the same as it does in Australia, except it's six months off. If I were, if I were to do the same thing with total excess mortality, or total mortality, it would look identical. Total mortality due to cardiovascular disease looks like that. Total mortality from just about anything other than accidents that has to do with the body, looks like that. Way more people die in the wintertime than die in the summertime. So you're like, okay, well, maybe it's the cold air or maybe it's the humidity. It could be. It could be, but let, we'll work on that. But I want, I want you first to understand, look at what we're talking about here. Why does influenza kill so many people in the wintertime? Why is it allowed to do that? Absolutely. And then we say, well, how, okay, so these people with low, remember they were talking about low vitamin D levels? Hey, if you've got low vitamin D levels, you're more at risk for dying for COVID-19. Let's give vitamin D, right? What is vitamin D a, a, a marker of? Sunlight. Is it possible 
that the reason why people with low vitamin D levels dying from COVID is because vitamin D is just simply a, a way of marking if you're getting enough sunlight. And if you give them vitamin D, is that taking care of all the near-infrared radiation, all the other aspects of sunlight? Can we replace sunlight by giving you a pill of vitamin D? What do you think? I don't think so. I'm going to show it to you. So here was a study that was done. Autumn COVID-19 surge dates in Europe. This is a great study. This was in 2020. And what this was before vaccines, okay? 2020, and what they did was they said, okay, the sun in autumn of 2020 is starting to go lower and lower and lower in the sky, all right? So things are changing in Europe. They're getting less sun, and they're getting colder air, and they're probably getting more humid air, okay? Let's see what happens. And so what they did is they said, let's mark off the countries when we start to see the surges happen. Which countries are the, are the surges going to happen the first? So they, they ranked them out. The first graph is looking at temperature. And notice that black line is completely flat. What does that tell you? There was absolutely no correlation with which, with which country did COVID surge first and what the temperature was. It made no difference. The second graph in the middle, they decided to look at humidity. There was no correlation whatsoever. Humidity did not predict which country was going to get a surge first. Do you know what did predict which country was going to get a surge first? Latitude. The first country, Finland. And as the sun is coming down, which country is now going to have less, the, the, the least amount of sun as that sun starts to come down into the south as we go toward winter? It's going to be the countries in the north. And sure enough, in September and October, the first country to get the surge of COVID-19 was Finland. And you can mark it off if you can see the flags. It was Finland, then it was followed by, what's the, what's the blue flag with the, with the yellow? That's, uh, is that Sweden? That's Sweden. Okay, so you guys are going to have to help me out there. And then you had Russia. And then I think that's Great Britain. And then I see the Netherlands. And I see Romania. Then I see Germany and Switzerland. And what's the country in the very top corner? You can barely see it. Guess which one that is? It's Greece. You're absolutely right. It fit absolutely perfectly. In other words, what determined when you had a surge in the country was simply where you were on the map. Because that's, all, that's exactly what determines how much sun you're getting. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So why is this? This is something you have to learn about uh, COVID-19. There are pro-oxidants in your cell and there are antioxidants in your cell. Pro-oxidant would be an angiotensin II. I have it up there as angio-AT2. But here's what the body does. The body takes this thing that is a pro-oxidant that's bad and converts it into an antioxidant, which is good. That's angiotensin 1-7. That's, a, that's like a, in basketball, that's like a, a four-point switch, right? They're going down the court, they're about to score a basket, you steal the ball, and you go down to the other court and you score a basket. That's like a four-point switch. That's what the body does with these pro-oxidants of angiotensin II. It takes something that's bad and actually converts that molecule into something that's good. That's what it does. Unfortunately, the thing that does that is an enzyme called ACE2. Does that sound familiar? Well, not ACE inhibitors, but uh, this is ACE2. This is the target of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So when SARS-CoV-2 infects your cell, it now no longer is able to convert angiotensin II into angiotensin 1-7. And so what happens is you have a buildup of angiotensin II, which leads to reactive oxygen species, and you have a breakdown or reduction in angiotensin 1-7, which then increases more reactive oxygen species. Furthermore, the virus hits that ACE2, and it also brings WBCs, or white blood cells, to the area, which also has their own antioxidant or their own reactive oxygen species. So basically what's happening here is that a viral infection with SARS-CoV-2 causes your cells to go swing way over to the side of pro-oxidative stress. And so if your body's cells are out of whack to begin with, that may be the, enough to knock them over the edge. The, to take the analogy further, if your cooling system on your car is working just barely enough, and then you start to go up the hill called COVID-19, you could poop out before you get to the top of the hill. If, you, if on the other hand, you have a very well-regulated engine with a good cooling system, you're gonna be able to take that hill without a problem. So who are the people that can't make it up that hill? People who are obese, people with cardiovascular disease, people with renal disease. These are the people that have bad cardiovascular health and are on the edge waiting for that wind just to blow them over the edge. So what do we need to do? We need to find a way to 
compensate for that because that, those reactive oxygen species will burn the cell and cause a, and we actually have seen this, the endothelial cells which coat the, the, uh, the, the vasculature, when they get damaged, they release something underneath them in the subspace called von Willebrand's factor. This von Willebrand's factor comes out and it binds with platelets and you get these very tiny microscopic white clots, which is exactly what they found on autopsies in patients. It wasn't these large clots, that comes later, but acutely in COVID-19, the patient's uh, vasculature was plugged up with these small clots and they were coming in happy hypoxics. You remember that story? They're coming in, they looked normal, but their oxygen levels were extremely low. This is the mechanism for what happened. So what happens? Melatonin can come in and mop up the reactive oxygen species. Going outside in the sun can give you lots of melatonin and mop up these reactive oxygen species. I just saw a study that came out and it showed that people who don't drink, don't smoke, have plenty of sleep, eat a good nutritious diet, and have a low BMI, have over a 30% reduction in chances of getting long COVID after COVID-19 infection. That just came out. They missed the other eight of the new start ones. Well, hopefully we'll get to that later. Um, but, okay? So this is what's going on in the cell. So in other words, COVID-19 is a, is a stress test on your oxidative stress. Prove it, you say. Okay, well, here's a study, severe glutathione deficiency, oxidative stress, and oxidative damage in adults hospitalized with COVID-19. Implications for glycine and NAC. NAC is an antioxidant. Okay, and I recommended very early on, people who are watching my channel, that uh, I recommended taking NAC. Because uh, actually, I learned this from, you know who I learned this from? Dr. Neil Nedley. He was the one that showed us that uh, for the flu, that taking 600 milligrams of NAC twice daily, at least for the flu season, was a reasonable thing to do. It did not reduce the incidence of infection, but it did reduce the symptomatology or the severity of that. Again, I believe the flu also works through a very similar mechanism as this. But let's, let's look at the data. So here we have the data. The blue are the controls and the red are the COVID. And what we're looking at here is intracellular Re, uh, reduce glutathione. Basically, we're looking at how many antioxidant material is there in the cell. And you can see in, across the board, no matter what age you are, if you are a control, if you don't have COVID, you're going to have more antioxidants than if you have COVID. Why? Because COVID is using up your antioxidants. All right, here's another slide. This is looking at plasma T-bars. This is a measure of oxidative stress. Notice across the board, but obviously it's worse in the older age group, those that have COVID have higher levels of oxidative stress in their plasma. And then finally here, plasma F2 isoprostane. This is a surrogate marker of oxidative damage. So this is actual damage to the cell. And where's that damage going to be? It's going to be in the mitochondria. These are, this, is the, this is the engine of your car that you're damaging. It's like not putting oil in the car. It's not like filling up your, your antifreeze. And what's happening is it's seizing up and you're causing knocking in the engine, and you expect now to go out and run the Indy 500. It's not gonna happen, because you're damaging your mitochondria. And, and you see it across the board, but again, it's in the oldest age group. Those with COVID are gonna have more damage in their mitochondria than those that don't have COVID-19. And we, we've known that, that, that vitamin D deficiency has been associated with COVID-19, but let me, let me suggest to you, I believe that I, I take vitamin D supplementation. But there is no way that I believe that my taking vitamin D supplementation is a substitute for me going outside. There's no way. I think, this is what I think, I think vitamin D is important, but I think that vitamin D levels is a marker for how well you are doing with sunlight exposure. If you have vitamin D levels and you're supplementing with vitamin D and you have a good vitamin D level, great news. But if you haven't changed also your, your behavior of getting outside, you're not getting the benefits that you need. So we, we've seen this. People with low vitamin D levels have lower survival probability in COVID-19. There's no question about it. But I love this study, okay? So this is a study that you guys should take to heart because this involves you more than it involves me. I live in Southern California, and there's no time of the year where I can't get vitamin D because I live that far south. You, however, you don't get vitamin D at all because the sun is not coming up high enough. It can't penetrate the atmosphere at this time of year. It's just starting to happen, and you're not going to get vitamin D. So 
But the good news is, you're not getting vitamin D, but what are you still getting even though the sun is that low in the sky? Near infrared radiation. So don't say, what's the use? They've said that we're not getting any vitamin D. There's no use in me going outside because I live in Washington. They're wrong. You can get infrared radiation when the sun is about to set. That's because it can penetrate. So check out what they did in the study. Ultraviolet A, they, so they looked at ultraviolet A radiation and COVID-19 deaths in the USA were replication studies in England and Italy. So check this out. The first map is of the United States. And what they did is, they no, did you see that gray part of the United States? They basically said, we're not gonna look at anybody in this area because even in the winter time, you can get enough vitamin D to mess up our study. So we're just gonna eliminate you from the study. We're only gonna look at people north of that gray area. And that's, that's where we are right now. And what they asked this question, they said, does survival from COVID-19 have to do with the amount of ultraviolet A radiation that you may be getting? In other words, the, the latitude. And what did they find? In the graph below, they showed that the higher the latitude was, the worse the COVID-19 deaths. They said, whoa, let's see if we can repeat this study in Italy, or sorry, in England. And as you can see, did they have to gray anything out in England? No, because <laughs> England is so far north, there's no way anybody in the wintertime is going to get enough vitamin D. So they looked at the whole country, and they found exactly the same thing. The higher north you were, the more likely you were to die of COVID-19. They did the same study in Italy. They found exactly the same results to the point that they said this. This was the conclusion that they said. In conclusion, this study is observational and there any, for any casual interpretation needs to be taken with caution. However, if the relationship identified proves to be causal, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention. And, and furthermore, they said, given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway, it suggests new possible COVID-19 therapies. New. I've got news for them. It's not new. It's pretty old. It's, we were doing this 100 years ago. We were doing this in the sanitariums. Look at those buildings. They were designed to put people outside. We knew this. We knew that sunlight exposure did something to the human body and improved their abilities to, I mean, take a look. I, I know people that have, I, I know a neurosurgeon, and she trained in Seattle. And she told me that there's a county hospital in Seattle, you guys probably know this better than I do, in Seattle that had a solarium, a place where patients would go in, in the summertime and the wintertime where they could basically sunbathe inside underneath the glass. Okay, this is what they used to do. Now, based on the information that I've just told you, listen to a health reformer from the 1800s. Remember what I told you about how do you feel infrared radiation? How do you feel it? Warmth. The feeble one should press out into the sunshine as earnestly and naturally as do the shaded plants and vines. The pale and sickly grain blade that has struggled up out of the cold of early spring puts out the natural and healthy deep green after enjoying for a few days the health and life-giving rays of the sun. Go out into the light and warmth of the glorious sun, you pale and sickly ones, and share with vegetation its life-giving, health-dealing power. They say that she didn't know the whys, just the whats. I don't know, maybe she did know the whys. Isn't that amazing? She wrote this in 1871, 150 years ago. And now we're beginning to figure out why this may be the case. Remember what I said about light after nine o'clock? Here she is again talking to her secretary. Make it a habit not to sit up after nine o'clock. Every light should be extinguished. This turning night into day is a wretched, health-destroying habit. She did not know about melatonin. She did not know about the circadian rhythm. She did not know about antioxidants or the mitochondria. This is pretty impressive, folks. All right. Cardiopulmonary and hematological effects of near-infrared light. So this is an amazing study that when I saw it, I almost fell out of my chair. 
Because what were we saying? We were saying that the thing that, is that COVID-19 could be missing out on, what, what we could do to patients who had COVID-19, like what would you do knowing this if somebody, if one of your friends came to you and said, I've got COVID-19, I'm getting worse, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like I need to go to the hospital, okay? But they're not quite there. What would you do? Get them outside. And so what, so what kind of light would you think they would need to have? Near infrared light. Folks, this team from Brazil did a study back in 2020. And this is, by the way, this is published in an impact factor journal of 6.252. What does that mean? It's in the top 5% of journals that are published in terms of impact factor. This is the Journal of Photochemistry and Photobiology, and it's the B version of it, which is the biology version. Top, top journal. This group took 30 patients and they randomized, these are 30 inpatient COVID-19 patients, and they, they actually physically manufactured a vest that they put on the patients that on the inside of the vest had LED lights that were specifically designed to transmit at 920 nanometers. This is what the vest looked like. You see all those lights, those LED lights? And normally the LED lights that we're used to only transmit in the visible spectrum. These lights were different. They were designed specifically for 920 nanometers, which is smack dab right in the middle of the near-infrared spectrum. And then they put them on them like this. Now, you cannot see the light coming out from these LEDs even when they're on. Why? Because it's outside of the visible spectrum, correct? But they would decide when they... So everybody wore it. Even the control group wore the vest. They just didn't have it turned on. They tried to make sure it was absolutely controlled appropriately. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Okay. So 300 infrared LEDs, oh, sorry, 940 nanometers, not 920, I'm sorry, 940. Each one was only 200th of a watt. Uh, the total optical power was 6 watts. Average power density, you can see there, the vest size covered about 2,000 square centimeters. 30 patients, 50 to 80 years of age, COVID-19 diagnosis, BMI was less than 30, no history of cancer in these patients, no photosensitivity, none of them were intubated, and they had them for seven days, doing it for only 15 minutes a day. So they could go from patient to patient, giving them their 15-minute treatment, and they did it every day for seven days. So what happened? You can't see these results, but let me tell you, the ones that got the near-infrared radiation had better pulmonary function test scores, got their oxygen requirements down faster, and actually left the hospital four whole days earlier. Because of the mortality was so small in, in this whole population age group, the, the difference between in a, a population of 30 was not statistically significant, but there was dramatic clinical differences in these patients. Do I need to tell you about what happened when Wells Rubel, the first president of the College of Medical Evangelists, before he came there, was the medical director at the New England Sanitarium, and he wrote in Life and Health, May 1st, 1919, about his experience during the pandemic, about how he was taking care of patients in the sanitariums versus how they were taking care of patients at the Army military bases. They were doing hydrotherapy, getting their patients outside, they were uh, making sure they were having rest. Their Mortality rate during the Spanish flu was one-sixth of that of the army hospitals. All right. So what do they show? Infrared LED photobiomodulation. This is from the, part, the article. Combined with conventional therapy outcomes. Enhance the effect of conventional therapy on COVID-19 patients, presenting a statistically significant improvement in the recovery of vital cardiopulmonary functions, partial oxygen saturation, tidal volume, maximum inspiratory pressure, maximum expiratory pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, systolic blood pressure, as well as hematological components, including leukocytes and segmented neutrophils and lymphocytes. One of the things that we see in COVID-19 COVID-19 patients is their lymphocytes. If their lymphocytes are very low, that's a poor prognosis. With these patients, we saw them come up very quickly, and they recovered very fast. Pulmonary function testing is an objective measure of pulmonary uh, of the lungs. Okay, so it's not it's not attributable to someone subjectively titrating. You do a pulmonary function test, you can only do a pulmonary function test, right? Statistically significant reduction in the time of hospitalization stay. It was a whole four day difference over seven days. The time with adventitious noise improved from the date of the patient's hospital intake is significantly reduced, and patients an improvement in the PSI and the NLCR, 
uh, indices when compared to conventional therapy, and the power of the statistical analysis of the results exceeded 80%. And this is the reason why it was published in this paper, because it was a good paper. It was a randomized control trial, blinded. So where are we today? Why have we gotten into this situation? On the left, I have what a near-infrared photograph would look like on a wheat field in Kansas. It's bright. On the right, I have a near-infrared picture of our home schools and offices. That's what it looks like right now. Why is that? Because we have walls that the sun doesn't penetrate. We have glass that is specifically designed to exclude near-infrared radiation. Why? Because near-infrared radiation causes warmth and heat, and that causes an increase in the cooling costs. So we don't want that inside. And then, the old incandescent bulbs that we had, they, they produced a lot of energy in the near-infrared spectrum. But that also uses a lot of energy. And so what do we do? We, to make them more efficient, we just have them transmit light in the visible spectrum. And that's called full spectrum. Doesn't that make you feel good when you go out and get a light bulb? Full spectrum? What you really want is complete biological spectrum because our body needs near-infrared radiation that we get from the sun, we're not getting it from LED lights. And that's the reason why, in our homes, that's what we're getting, as opposed to what we're getting on the left. And that's the reason why I said at the very beginning that if you want to get healthy, you need to go outside. So on the far left, in 1800, the blue is the amount of visible light that we were getting as human beings, and the red it was the amount of near-infrared radiation. Why is that? Because we spent 50% of our time outdoors, and we would sit at the campfire in the evening time, and we would light candles, okay? Then in, eight, in 1950, we had 100% incandescent bulbs. We had plain glass that transmitted near-infrared radiation, and we spent only 25% of our time outdoors. So there was a, a reduction in near-infrared, but not that much. The third graph is 1990. Just 1990. That was only, what, 30 years ago. 50% fluorescent bulbs, 50% incandescent bulbs, plain glass windows still, and we're only 15% outdoors. Now we go to the present day. The present day where we have laws on the books that determine what kind of windows we put in our homes. We have laws on the books about the kind of bulbs that are sold at Home Depot. We have social media. We have kids that would rather be inside on their computer rather than outside. Do you remember Gen Xers out there? What did, what did mom say when we went out to play outside? Come home when the, or the lights come on, right? And in the summertime, we got a little shocked when we got inside and it was 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock up here, right? We don't do that anymore. Kids don't want to go out and play outside. They want to play on their computer. And what's happening? So it's a double whammy. They don't go outside and get near infrared radiation. They're playing on their computer and they're doing it late at night. Exactly. This is what's happened. So it's not all a diet issue. It's not all a processed food issue. Things have changed in other areas of our health other than food. Certainly there's been a difference there, but there's also differences here. And this is what's happened over the last century. So if we look here at the blue graph, the blue graph is your incandescent bulb. Notice that there's plenty of near-infrared radiation that's being emitted from the blue curve, which is the incandescent bulb. The orange is the sun. And it's doing a lot. The red is the 3,000K LED bulb that you pick up at Home Depot. There is absolutely no near-infrared light being emitted from, the, from that bulb. Further is that these bulbs that are non-incandescent, so the LED and the fluorescent, they all have what? Flicker. And we don't know what that's doing to the human brain. It's too fast for our brains to pick it up but there may be some uh, extra issues. I'll just say full disclosure, um, the two authors that wrote that paper, uh, Russell Ryder, is, he's the executive editor of Melatonin Research, that journal, but the other guy, uh, Scott Zimmerman, he is a, he's in actually in the business world, and he is currently the CEO of a light bulb company that's actually working on creating an LED bulb that transmits into the near-infrared spectrum and does not flicker. So look, look him up if you're interested. Um, 
he, he has some interesting ideas, uh, and he's, he's well dialed into everything that we're just talking about right here and the problems that we're seeing in terms of health. Here's a graph that uh, looks at the different types of low E glass. You see you have low E glass, which passes a lot of, uh, of uh, near infrared, medium, and low. How do you tell whether the glass in your home or building is a low E glass? Well, when the sun's coming through, stand next to it. If you feel the warmth of the sun hitting you, the chances are it's letting in near-infrared radiation. If not, then it's not. Visible picture of a campfire, this is what we were used to as human beings for thousands and thousands of years on the left-hand side. We had the blanket of stars at night. We would go around a campfire at night. Low, red, dark everywhere else. And now what, what do we have? Visible picture of Times Square, lights high up, blue, all hours of the night. It's the, it's the city that never sleeps. And neither do we, unfortunately. So what happens when you go outside in your, in, in your natural environment? Like we said, is that as the sun is coming up, as the sun is coming up and you're outside to greet it, near-infrared radiation is coming into your body and it's generating stores of melatonin to prepare for the onslaught of the day. When the sun hits 10 o'clock in the, in the uh, morning, ultraviolet radiation is now coming in, but you're getting the benefits of vitamin D, but you've already put up your shields from the melatonin that you've produced earlier in the day to be able to go through the onslaught. As the sun starts to go, it hits 2 o'clock, the onslaught stops. Any damage that has occurred is fixed by the near-infrared radiation as the sun goes down, and by the time the sun goes down, you've gone through the entire cycle, and your body is ready for the next day. You see how the Lord has put in all of this. It's perfect. It's perfect. I remember there's a quote. I don't have it up here. But Ellen White was on a ship, and she was very sick, and it was cloudy and stormy for days. And she just waited. She says, I cannot wait for the sun to come out. She says, the sun is a physician. That's what she actually said. The sun is a physician. So we've talked about how humans interact with light. Sleep, circadian rhythm, mood, and we talked about the mitochondria. Here are the points, though, that I would make. Overall, what we can do, number one, get as much natural sunlight, direct or indirect, as possible, avoiding glass in between within reason after waking up in the morning. If you do that, I guarantee you, you're going to notice an improvement in how you sleep at night and how you feel and in your energy. Getting outside. Here's a bonus. If you go outside and do a little bit of exercise, now you're even getting even a more bonus because you doing it two to three times a week for 20 minutes a day, which is about the same amount of time that you need for sunlight, is even better. And if you have the ability to walk through a forest where there are trees and phytocytes and getting that infrared radiation. So getting up every morning and walking, taking a short walk through the trees, getting fresh air, getting sunlight, even on a cloudy day, is going to be better than staying inside. Number two, exposure to low-level red light, fire, sunset, at sunset time is advisable. We all, we all seem to be drawn to sunsets. They're so beautiful. There's actually something about that. It tells your brain that the sun has set and it gets your circadian rhythm on par. And then finally, avoiding any type of light exposure after sunset, especially blue light and especially one to two hours prior to bedtime because we want the cooling system at night to be able to kick in when we're not getting the near-infrared radiation from the sun during the day. Now, I think we're our, we have reached the end. There's, I'll take time for questions, but here are the most common questions that I get, and I want to answer them. Should we take melatonin supplements? Uh-huh, right? Okay, so the first problem is melatonin supplements are not FDA regulated. It's possible that you could go down to the store and buy a bottle of melatonin, and it would, not, it would have cardboard in it or chopped up cardboard. You wouldn't even know what you're getting. So make sure you get a reputable organization or someone that uses a third party to make sure that there actually is melatonin in there. That's number one. Number two, only take melatonin right before you're going to go to sleep because when you take oral melatonin, it dissolves and goes into your blood and your blood uses melatonin, your body uses melatonin in the blood to signal all the cells that it's time to go to sleep. So that's be the only time that I would use it. And number three is that unfortunately when you take high levels of melatonin, I would say above five milligrams, going up to 10, anywhere in that range, you have a paradoxical effect and you actually don't go to sleep as well. 
So using low doses only at night if you choose to. I would not depend on supplemental melatonin to do what we've talked about today to make sure that your body is in redox balance. Okay? All right, so with that, I will open it up for questions. Yes. Oh, let, wait for the mic, because we want to hear the question, yeah. Is there not uh, some infrared radiation coming out of a nice warm bath or a hot shower? There is nice infrared radiation coming out of a hot warm because it's heat, but it's not that much. You're, you're referring to something physicists would refer to as black body radiation, like a really hot object will emit near infrared uh, light. It's not that much, but there is quite a bit from a fire, for instance. A fire will give off plenty of near, I mean, you probably experienced this, is that uh, even though there, you're not close enough to a fire to get convection currents for heat, you'll still feel that heat because it's radiating out at you. So uh, a fire, you're going to feel it much more. It's, it's probably too little coming from a hot bath. Uh, but hot baths have their own benefits uh, as well. So yeah. PDT treatments, like for basal cell carcinoma. PDT. Uh, photodynamic therapy, oh. where they put the like 360 degree heat on whatever the surface, body surface it is. There's a lot of technology that's being used that has that that is similar to this. For instance, they will do lasers at certain uh, infrared radiation wavelengths that causes the body to vasodilate because of nitric oxide. That's another effect. Um, what you're referring to may have to do with cancer treatments and things of that nature. Um, it's probably connected in some way, although I can't go through and elucidate the biochemical connections, but yes. Light, light has many benefits on multiple levels. And the second part to that is, is what about um, the people who, like myself, for instance, spent many, many years working night shifts? Yeah. I, that was the other question I was going to say. So for those of you who have already worked night shift, I don't know what to tell you in terms of the damage being done, but, but realize that damage can be fixed. That's what your body does, is it fixes damage. And I'll just briefly say this really, really quickly. There are two ways that your body can fix damage very quickly. The, the two things are, number one, you have to prevent further damage, and you need to take down things that are damaged and liable and build them up good again. And the best way to do that is to, the best way to signal your body that it's time to fix things is fasting. Fasting. Nothing will tell your body more that it's time to fix things than fasting. This is why the other aspect of this is intermittent fasting. That will cause, so this is what I did. Oh, let me tell you really briefly what I had a patient. I had a patient with long COVID. And can you already see from our presentation how long COVID could very easily be a problem with damaged mitochondria because of oxidative stress? We, we have seen in studies that people with long COVID have problems with the enzymes in their mitochondria that specifically deal with fatty acids. Okay, and we've seen this. So... If you have damaged mitochondria, what you want to do is tear those things down and build them back. And when you fast, ketone production goes up. Ketone production is actually a signal to the body that it's time to induce uh, uh, proteins and enzymes that are involved with um, uh, production of, of replacement. So we already said that replacement and repair happens at night. So what the problem that we have in this country is that we eat too close to going to bed at night. And so what happens is that that repair time gets severely curtailed. So if you were to eat, for instance, in the morning and early afternoon, and then not eat anything after 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon on a daily basis, you would maximize the time that your body has the ability to repair. I had a patient with long COVID, 8 out of 10 shortness of breath, low energy, feeling horrible for one year before he came to see me. I went through my entire checklist of things I, want, I wanted to make sure that he didn't have heart disease. We did a stress echo. I wanted to make sure he didn't have blood clots in his lung. I did a, a VQ scan. I wanted to make sure uh, we checked his, his legs. We did everything. We ruled out everything. And all I was left with was a guy with a bunch of negative tests, and he still felt horrible. So it was at this point that I said, 
okay, this is what we need to do. I had the whole discussion that I just had with you. He got really excited because he understood it. It made sense to him that his mitochondria were damaged because of the infection, and the only way to feel better was to get new mitochondria, but the body didn't know that it needed to tear it down. So I needed to tell him to tear it down. So he instituted a diet where he would eat at 8 or 9. He was retired, so it really didn't matter. 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock for breakfast, 2 o'clock, his last meal of the day passed his lips before 5.30, religiously, for a month before I saw him back. When he came back, I, I already knew that something had happened. He had bright eyes. He was, he was excited. We spent the entire 30-minute visit talking about the changes that happened in his life. His gastroesophageal reflux disease completely went away. It was gone. He, he, he came off his medication. His energy levels went up dramatically, and his shortness of breath level went from an 8 out of 10 to a 3 out of 10, and he said, it's a 3 out of 10, but it actually really doesn't even bother me anymore. I'm not even conscious of it. And... He had done nothing different except institute getting outside in the sunshine to make sure that his melatonin was protecting the, the, the new mitochondria that he was making and telling his body it's time to take these things and to break them down. Your body knows what's damaged in your body. It knows what it's, it's slated on a list. Here are the things that need to get repaired. The problem is, is that your body has never had a chance to do it. And the way to get your uh, body your chance to do it is to say, it's closing time, we're, getting, we're exiting the fed state, and we're now going into the fasting state. And so when you do that, be prepared for things to be broken down and to be built up the next day in the next cycle. Um, I think that answers the question. Uh, somebody was here next. Or, oh, right over there, yes. Yeah, I heard that there is some type of benefits with sauna. I think the red... <laughs> Or something like that. Yes. And okay. then if water can, uh, if light, sunlight can benefit, we receive, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> if we still receive the sunlight through water. Yes. So sauna is the question and the benefits. Real quickly, there are two types of sauna. There is the traditional sauna that the Finns do, and we have plenty of data on sauna in Finland. Um, we have data that goes back decades. In fact, there are so many saunas in Finland that if all of the Finns all at once decided to go into a sauna at the same time, there would be plenty of room to hold all of the, all of the Finns. I'm not joking. Um, when, they, when they do studies in Finland on saunas, the control group are the people that do it once a week. That's the control group, okay? Then they, they compare the two times a week, the three times a week, the four times a week, the five times a week that they go into the sauna. So we have reams and reams of data on the regular traditional sauna where you go in and, and it heats up, okay? And if for, for those of you who want to see a video on that and all of the benefits, let me highly recommend to you, on our MedCram channel, we actually interviewed Rhonda Patrick who actually uh, has, has learned from the guru of saunas in Finland. If you go to our MedCram channel and type in sauna, or type in MedCram sauna, that video will come up, and Kyle Allred, my partner, interviewed her for about an hour on all of the questions about the benefits of sauna, and the video has gotten well over a million views. Okay, so it's, it's a very popular video now that people are looking at. But you're not asking about traditional sauna, you're asking about infrared sauna. And that's a situation where you can, you can get these saunas and you can put it into your room and they have these bulbs that emit at, at near infrared. I think it's beneficial. The problem is, is we don't have as much data on that type of infrared sauna that we do on the traditional sauna. So I don't know what the benefits are, but there are studies that are ongoing. And for some people, that may be the answer. Uh, I can tell you this. My, um, I know people that uh, they put on a mask every morning, okay? I'll just, I'll just say it this way. I know people that put a mask on every morning. How would I know that? And um, they get infrared light onto their face, and this is helping them create and grow collagen to make them look more young and healthy and vital. That's all I'm going to say. Otherwise, my wife might be upset at me. Okay. <laughs> yes. It works. It works, yeah. Do you have a question? So you said that... When you feel the warmth from the sun, that's when you're getting the near infrared. But you also said that you get near infrared on a cloudy day. Not what as much. Okay, so let me let me back that up. A cloudy day is going to significantly reduce near infrared radiation. However, it's not going to it's still brighter from a visible spectrum aspect than it would be if you were in your house. 
So the purpose for going outside on a, on a cloudy day is not necessarily to get near infrared radiation, but it's to get the light into your eye for the first aspect of what we talked about, which was setting your circadian rhythm and making sure your perihabendular nucleus, nucleus is getting light for depression. Does that make sense? And since you brought up COVID, I have a question. Yeah. So my daughter, we had COVID on the 4th of July this year. She has, her nose has not stopped running since we had COVID. I don't know if that means she has long COVID or what that means. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, could we, I mean, could we? Can she, can she detect uh, olfaction, smell, or is that, is that a problem? Yeah, she can smell. She can smell, okay. Um, yeah, I've not heard of a nose continuously running other than the possibility that she may have gotten a heightened allergy to seasonal allergies. That's a possibility. Um, a quick look with a uh, with a otoscope to look in the back of her throat and uh, looking in the back of her throat looking for cobblestoning would tell me if that's like an allergic rhinitis. She might benefit from some uh, some allergy sprays or seeing an allergist. I don't want to treat people, you know, remotely, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, should we? I, w I just want to ask a question. There might be people that we've been here for an hour and a half. Should we close this aspect and people that want to leave? And then um, those that want to stay, we could answer questions because some might want to leave and they don't want to like interrupt. Any thoughts on that? Okay. All right. Why, why don't we just say a prayer and those that want to leave, because I don't want to hold you here. Um, let's, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for opening up your second book uh, in, in, in terms of, of science and health that you have given us all of this wonderful information that we didn't know why, but we knew the what. And hopefully now that we know the why, we'll listen to the what more um, in thy name. Please give us uh, uh, traveling mercies in the name of Jesus. Amen.